We are ahead of the curve, devoted to Christ, a voice for the voiceless, accurate in preferring solutions to difficult problems. We are non-conformists, defining culture, compassionate towards humanity and the earth. We are also extraordinary high flyers who are reframing the world we live in. High life, we advance. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, are you ready for the word this morning? We're going to uh, share the word in a different way. We're going to share from um, using the questions as a springboard this morning. Well, let us pray. Father, we're so thankful for um, your word. Uh, we thank you because the entrance of your word gives light and it brings understanding uh, to the simple. So, Lord, um, we, we just open our hearts to the ministry of your spirit today. Um, we know the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, so help us, Holy Spirit. I will receive the word with meekness, because it is able to save our souls. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so um, we had a lot of questions. Um, as you know, we've been, um, we've been doing this course, uh, or not a course, but the the Family Matters series for quite a few months now. We started in March, and you know how the Lord sneaks certain things on you. I had no idea we are going to be teaching for four months, um, but it's been a great time. And, you know, I believe that uh, when there's a genuine hunger for something, the Lord always meets us at our place of hunger. The Bible says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. They shall be filled. They shall be filled. Hallelujah. So I really thank God for the time we've had. Um, you know, we did have a lot of questions, and Pastor Nita and I are going to deal with some of the questions. We may not be able to cover all, all of the questions, um, but uh, I just want to encourage you that we're going to keep dealing with this one way or the other. Uh, Pastor Femi is going to be here in November, and we're doing a workshop um, for the weekend, and he's going to be focusing on, on marriage and, and marriage relationships. And um, we're going we're gonna to have a session during that weekend where we're going to talk about intimacy and sexual intimacy, and uh, we're going to have a specialist in that area come speak to us as couples, because that's a very important um, part of our lives and God wants husband and wife to be sexually fulfilled. Um, so we're going to deal with that. So even if we don't um, deal with your specific question, um, just know that it's going to be an ongoing thing. Now, I have some thoughts, uh, some things I want to say um, uh, based on the questions that came through. Um, some comments I want to make, just general comments as a background. You know, we dealt with this topic for four months, and I tried as much as possible during the course of the teaching to emphasize that we can't deal with everything in one session, and um, it's important that you get the whole thing. You know, it's a little bit like trying to describe uh, an elephant, and you happen to be there on the day where we're describing the trunk of it. You know, and you say the elephant is white, it's hard, you know. There are different, ty different parts to this. And, and I think from some of the questions, I could see that some people only caught a particular session and they extrapolated and assumed I was, you know, I had a certain perspective. So you would not get it until you've listened to the whole thing. Yeah? So please, it's important that you get the whole series. The other thing I will say is that um, it's sort of obvious to me that, and it's a common thing, that sometimes we listen with the ears of somebody else. You know, I, I like to think that we're led by the Holy Spirit and, um, you know, the Lord leads us. And... Um, you know, but sometimes when you are hearing a message, rather than focusing on what does this mean for me, we get caught up in 
what it means for somebody else and how I wish they were here to hear this. And it's interesting how after some messages, people come up to me and say, man, I wish my husband was here. Or I wish my wife was here. And they miss what the Lord is trying to do because the Lord was actually trying to get across to you. You know, if I'm in a meeting where they're talking about drunkenness and they're talking about how you should stay off abusing alcohol, I don't care how long they talk for because it wouldn't affect me. I've never had a problem with drunkenness. But there are other things that people can start talking about that I'd wish they just moved on quickly, yeah? Uh, And unfortunately, you're missing something because when you feel uncomfortable about a message, what it means is that there's something about it that the Lord is trying to get across to you. And it doesn't really matter where you go, you are going to keep hearing the same thing. And if you're just absorbed with the fact that, oh, they keep talking about this aspect. Why don't they focus on the other one? You are missing the point. You're missing the point. And I say this to you as your pastor. I love you. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, give you a hard time, but you're missing the point. It's a little bit like what happened in John 21 when um, Peter led the disciples to go fishing when they knew they should have been doing something else. And then, you know, he repented. The Lord appeared. And the Lord started telling him about his life. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And it was a a very uncomfortable thing to talk about. I said, of course you know I love you. Of course you know I love you. And the Lord began to talk to him. Then after a while, he couldn't handle it anymore and said, what about John? What's going to happen to him? Why are you talking about me? What about him? And the Lord said, what is that to you? I'll deal with John. You follow me. Uh, And I could see from some of the messages, particularly last Sunday, message, it seemed to irritate something in a lot of people. Now, rather than focusing on somebody else, ask yourself, what was the Lord trying to get across to me? Because if you don't learn that lesson, somebody once said to me that in Christ, we don't fail. We just repeat over and over again until we pass. If we don't learn the lesson, um, you will keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Okay, so that's my background. Like I said, Pastor Nita and I are going to deal with different aspects of this. Um, and um, I'll deal with some, she'll deal with some. And if I miss something out, she'll add to it. And if she misses something out that I want to comment on, I'll add to it. Praise God. Mm-hmm. And if from your question I could see who it was that asked the question, I might call you out to, <laughs> to expand on it. Then you'll know your pastor is really filled with the Holy Ghost. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Okay, let me dive in. All right, we've got some time. So um, now, also, lastly, there were a lot of questions in the same category. So what we've tried to do is sort of rationalize some of the questions and just make sure we deal with um, at least one in every category. So, question. What's the role of personality traits in marriage? As for pastor's Sunday message, is it one size fits all? Aren't some men not naturally high deeds and therefore seem passive and some women in reverse order? Doesn't the opposite poles attract, keep and help a marriage sometimes? If a man in a bid to relinquish his perceived passivity becomes assertive and is already married to a naturally assertive wife, will that marriage not be um, a uh, a candidate for endless counseling and possible dissolution? Where is the role of what works best for a marriage? Don't we see this trait play out in our offices, female and male bosses, pastors, fiery versus gentle, Paul and Barnabas? Isn't it wisdom to let peace reign and make some sacrificial adjustments. Your thoughts, please. Do we all understand the question about personality traits? Now, he mentioned uh, a high D. That's referring to the DISC personality system, which looks at the fact that everyone is a different personality type. Some are more sort of dominant. Some influence uh, steadiness and conscientiousness. Now, If you look in scripture, you will see that uh, the roles of husbands and wives in scripture do not prescribe 
or recommend a particular personality type for any of the sexes. All personality types are expressions of the nature of God. Okay? God has blessed you with your personality type and, you know, it's part of the expression of his person. And if you remember, when I mentioned about the deep desires in, every, in the heart of every man, um, you know, I said that there are three deep desires in the heart of every man. Um, uh, he, he desires a battle to fight, uh, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. I did say that that is the case irrespective of whatever personality type the man is, whether he's gentle or boisterous, um, those deep desires, and also in the heart of every woman, those deep desires remain the same as far as um, uh, irrespective of personality. Now, there is no room for passivity in a marriage irrespective of your gender or personality type. We're all meant to be involved in the success of the marriage and bringing it to the place where um, God has ordained it to be. And I also mentioned in one of the earlier sessions that in marriage, very often people that are very different tend to be attracted to one another. In fact, we need to celebrate that. Okay? If you study the history of covenant, people only went into covenant with one another on the basis of their different strengths and weaknesses. So um, opposites do attract. Very often people that are very different come together and that's the, that, in that covenant there is strength. Okay, So um, opposites do attract and sometimes you're married to someone who's very different from you and that's why covenant is important. I did also say that every married couple needs to find out what works for them in terms of role expectations. The Bible does not prescribe that, for instance, the man should manage the finances or the woman should do the shopping. I give an example of a friend of mine who actually goes to the market for his wife and it's because he likes going to the market. He's more effective at haggling, believe it or not, and he's a man. Okay? Um, so the Bible doesn't say that the man, you know, all these different things. Um, um, so what works best for your marriage is important. And just because culture um, has certain norms, it doesn't mean that the Bible is prescribing that. However, say to your neighbor, however, God does hold the man responsible for loving his wife like Christ loved the church. God does hold the woman responsible for respecting her husband, irrespective of the personality type. The Bible says that the husband is the head of his wife in the way that Christ is the head of the church. So it's not a personality type issue. It is the fact that God holds you responsible as the husband for being the priest of your home. And it also Following the example of Jesus who demonstrated his love by laying down his life for his, his bride, the husband is responsible for taking that first action of sacrificial love. That's what the Bible says. Um, so the husband is not better than his wife, but the Lord holds him responsible for loving her and protecting her and the wife to honor her husband. And we must all take our divinely ordered role in a relationship um, irrespective of um, our personality types. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So I hope that answers that question. Okay. By all means, if you ask the question and you want to have a, you want to expand on it, I am, you know. Okay. So let's go to the next question. I think... Um, Okay, Pastor Nita is going to answer. Part two of it. But I get to do part one, right? Okay. Okay, some men 
have uh, a low, is this libido, which is basically um, sexual desire, right? Either naturally or due to some earlier illness, though affectionate towards their wife, but are not able or lack the desire to sexually satisfy her. So they're not able or lack the desire to sexually satisfy her. Okay? I do understand that there are medications that could help, but not all the time. With no ethical option available to the woman, since other means to derive sexual pleasure outside of her husband will be a sin, the frustration often leads to other secondary issues in the marriage. Will Will a divorce request be out of order? Or is the in sickness and in health vow the only viable option for her? I know of such Christian marriage at the moment heading to the courts, compounded by the fact that it's been 10 years and no children. Okay, so we understand the question, right? Now, it's important, uh, if you look at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 1 to 3, um, and we looked at this last week, it's important to understand that sexual satisfaction is meant to be mutual. In fact, let's turn to it because there's another question that dealt with that. Um, but let's look at 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to 3 real quick from the New Living Translation. Could you put up New Living Translation? Thank you. It says, now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's sexual needs. Let me read that from the message Bible. I think the message brings it down to our level. Verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 7 says, Certainly, but only within a certain context, it is good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong, but marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality. Everyone say mutuality. The husband seeking to satisfy his wife. The wife seeking to satisfy her husband. So basically, in marriage, either party's sexual desires should be satisfied. Okay, and he talks about seeking to do that. One of the things I mentioned last week, which some people missed totally, because they thought I was focusing on the men, was the fact that in to get sexual satisfaction, it is important that there is communication. Um, one of the sessions I have with couples, especially primary, as part of premarital counseling, is... There's a list of sexual myths. One of the greatest myths is that um, men automatically know how to satisfy women. Um, and it's important that every man, just like every woman, learns what satisfies her husband. Okay? And that is something that we're going to go into in a lot more detail when we have the workshop. However, specific to this question... Um, it is important to seek counseling. It is important to speak to a doctor because sexual intimacy and sexual satisfaction is very important to your wife just as it is to your husband. Okay? Sometimes when we get ill, we go to a doctor and we get pills. Do we not? Yes? Um, it is not a thing of embarrassment to get a prescription that could help raise your sexual libido or libido. Yeah? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? There are things that can be done. There are ways that you can be helped. 
and it is important enough to seek help. Okay? Um, now, that does not mean, you know, self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit also. Yeah? So, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, even though this is God's plan for our lives, and as we continue to obey God, and as, um, as we continue to learn, we will be more effective. It doesn't mean that every time we have a challenge, we're thinking about, oh, what's the way out? Okay? Every married couple will tell you that they have confronted very difficult challenges, but over time, with the wisdom of God and with proper counsel, um, they find a way through. But it sounds from this question that you haven't actually sought, or this person hasn't actually sought medical help, and they've made certain assumptions, okay? The issue about not having children is uh, another matter, and for that, in sickness and in health, does come into it. We've made a commitment to one another. So you don't leave just because there's a challenge. And honestly, in Christ, there is no challenge that cannot be surmounted, that cannot be overcome. Okay? But um, the only thing I'll mention there is um, satisfaction is important. Get counseling. Receive prescription because your wife must needs to be satisfied and you need to be satisfied as well. Does that make sense? All right. Let's welcome Pastor Nita and... Um, I didn't get the clap when I was coming up. <laughs> so you want to talk about the second one? Yeah? All right. Okay, so question. It says, is there room for the reality of differences in libido when it comes to sex in marriage? Say, for example, a couple who love to have sex with one another. Um, sorry, a couple who, loved, who both love to have sex with one another, but the husband likes it every day and the wife just once a week. Um, when they do have sex. She says both, or the person says, um, they both love it, but they're just mismatched as far as the frequency of desire. Is there room for the expectation of the husband to be adjusted so that he, he wants, stroke, needs it daily? Um, he understands that his wife genuinely wants it but cannot physically enjoy it daily because she's just not wired that way. And if she's forced, it will breed re resentment and make her start feeling like she's being raped. I'm talking about a couple who is genuinely good, who has a, generally, a genuinely good and healthy approach to sex. But the wife just does not desire it as frequently as the husband does. And unless she starts doing sinful things like fantasizing and stuff to get her in the mood, she genuinely cannot perform more than once a week. Shouldn't the husband... in that case, work on adjusting his expectations to a frequency of once a week. Okay, so with all things, I'm, I paint a picture, and I'm going to paint this picture for you. Once a week, right, we've got 52 weeks in a year, yeah? So let's really break this down. So what you're saying is that every, um, every, every year, we have sex 52 times. Now, bearing in mind, and let's even say it's really planned, so every Wednesday we have sex um, during the year. Now, out of that 52 times, we have a period, yes, let's just say roughly, let's say five times it falls on a Wednesday. So that's, I can't do the math, somebody should do the math. 47. And then I work so I might be required to travel. So let's take off another five days for travel. 40, 42. And then I'm ill for three days in the year. Three Wednesdays, sorry. How many? 39. Good. All right. And then... On a particular Wednesday, I have to feign a headache because, you know, it's a girl thing, right? You know, it's like, oh, man, I've just got a headache, so I can't. So that Wednesday's out. So let's give it a couple more headache Wednesdays. Yes? How many are we left with? 37. Okay, so now, 37 times, yes, out of 365 days sounds to me like a deal breaker. Yeah? It sounds to me because even in your mind... You can't really say that when you said for better, for worse, 
yeah, and when you said we have a covenant, that 35 days every year we have great sex, it, it just doesn't sit well, yeah? Now, <clears throat> the, person, the person is asking if her husband can adjust to that. I, I don't think so. I'm not a man, but even as a woman, I, I kind of think that's, you're really shortchanging your spouse if you do that. And this is based on the scripture that Pastor read um, earlier. If you're satisfying somebody's needs, you can't say in the 10 years of your being married that you make love 300 times. Yeah, maybe my maths is wrong, but it's, it's just really, really, really very little. Yeah, so we're going to have to do more. Now, this person also said she's not wired that way. She's not wired to have um, great sex. And she says that they genuinely have a great sex life. I beg to differ. I feel that if you have a great sex life, you will want to make love to your husband or wife a lot more than the days we've given. Yeah? Now, what happens is when people say, um, you know, that they, 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 they're not wired that way or they just can't go more than once, I believe um, that it's because you actually do not enjoy sex. Yeah? I think that you actually do not enjoy sex. And the reason why is because a lot of times, you know, you get into a relationship and it seems as though we all feel like we, we know what to do straight away. Yeah? Now, you might have had past relationships, and I guess it happens a lot where people have had past sexual relationships before they come into the married one. And so what has worked with Jim or John or whoever it was, yeah, you, you kind of expect that and bring it back into this married relationship. And it's different, yes? And it's the same with the guys. You know, Luciane or, or Patricia probably is, is very different from your wife now, and, the, and she, her body might be built different, yeah? And I think a good sign, some, sometimes maybe we feel a little bit embarrassed about asking, like, okay, what do you like, what don't you like? You know, and I was thinking about that this morning, and I was thinking, well, you might not want to have that conversation of, okay, babes, what, what, what is it you like me to do or don't like me to do? But here's the thing. While you're, having, while you're making love, and, and I'm saying this more to the guys, while you're making love, do spend a little bit of time looking at your wife's face, yeah? If her jaw is clenched or she's kind of really stiff or she's looking at the ceiling or looking around, trust me, she's not having fun, yeah? She's, she's not having fun. It is not an enjoyable experience for her, yeah? You will know if you're not just focused on yourself when your partner is enjoying what is going on. So... Um, if you can't have the conversation, look at the body language, yeah? It should be that when you, when you make love to your spouse, that both parties, you know, want, you want to satisfy each other so much, but you yourself is like, um, you know, you, I'm, I'm, I feel that there are some young people still in this room. Um, but, you know, the, I, I just feel like there are some, some things that would cause your wife to want you more. Yeah, maybe you do something and she's, she's like, yes, 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 Sally met Harry type thing. <laughs> um, you know, so <laughs> if, if those things aren't happening, then there's a problem. So moving on swiftly, I think you kind of get the gist of what I'm trying to say there. Now she says, um, um, okay, so she says she doesn't want to feel forced because it will breed resentment and make her start feeling like she's being raped. That feeling should never happen. It, sh it shouldn't happen. I, I, I feel like as a, as a husband, you should never get to the point where you feel like you have to rape your wife to, um, to have sex. You know, that it, it will build resentment. You find a way, find a way to get to her, to reach her where she's at. Yeah? What, um, I know pastor has talked about like the, the um, number one language of love for women. And, we've said, and, and he said it was affection. But I have to tell you, see, number one is multilingual. Most women speak all five languages of love, and they're all important to them. Yeah? So don't, you know, it's not like, oh, okay, you look pretty, so hey, let's, you know, just 
jump into bed and we want, we want to have mad, passionate sex right now. It's not going to happen. Yeah? Operate within that boundary of like all five languages. Yeah? All five languages is what your wife speaks. Yeah? If you just take it from that point of view, you'll find that she herself will want to come and, and make you happy. Yeah, she will want to make you happy. She will want to, I mean, honestly, you walk through the door and you'll find that you have a different woman. Yeah, if you're meeting those needs and not meeting those needs just with that thing in your mind of like, okay, I'm going to do this so that we can swing from the chandeliers. Do you, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, do it because you genuinely love her because, because sex is covenant and, and covenant is always beautiful. At least it's meant to be. Yeah. So, and then she says, unless she starts doing sinful things like fantasizing and stuff like that to get her in the mood. Okay, fantasizing. There's a difference. You can fantasize about your spouse. That is not anything sinful. Yeah? It's when you start gawking at another guy or another girl, then you're getting into this sinful um, zone because in, it, adultery doesn't, it, it, adultery just isn't always just about like when you actually have sex with the person. It really starts with the lust of the eyes. Yeah? So, um, to fantasize about your spouse sometimes is very helpful. Yeah? And sometimes women like to be made love to while they're standing around doing their makeup and you're just sitting and making love with the person or to the person just by your look. Do you, do you know how, you know, you, you say like, oh, this person undressed me with their eyes and it just makes you feel so, um, so sexy with yourself. Yeah. Sometimes women, you have to create that atmosphere. Sometimes we, you know, the atmosphere just doesn't come easy. So you light your candles, you burn your incense, you, you put your sheets, you know, the nicer sheets you have, you spray perfume. Look, Songs of Solomon has talked about this. The sheets are perfumed. Yeah. Set the right atmosphere. Make, you know, make your room, make your room into a conducive <laughs> space. For, um, for that kind of activity to happen. Um, and then she says, okay, she genuinely can't perform more than once a week. I, 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 I think that you can if your husband makes you feel so wanted, yes, and so needed, so that you walk through the door and you're thinking, okay, let's just go to the bedroom. Light the candles, love. Well, thank you. Sorry, was that for me coming up or her going now? Praise God. Okay. Um, right, this is a very different kind of question. This is about homosexuality. So the question says, why do Christians treat homosexuals worse than adulterers? Is one worse than the other? Okay? So we're changing modes now. Why do Christians treat homosexuals worse than adulterers? Is one worse than the other? You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yeah? Uh, We are all in equal need of the grace of God for salvation, irrespective of sin. Yeah, the Bible says the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you look very quickly at Revelation 21 verse 7, it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in what? In the lake of fire which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Yeah, so we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, Therefore, it is important as Christians that we treat everybody with grace. Yeah, however, sin, irrespective of what kind of sin it is, should not be toyed with. Sin is dangerous. It destroys our fellowship with the Lord. Okay? Um, And the adage... God loves the sinner but hates the sin is also true. Okay, in uh, Jude 23, the Message Bible says, 
Go after those who take the wrong way. Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. The sin itself stinks to high heaven. Okay, that's uh, Jude 23, the Message Bible. Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. Say to your neighbor, not soft on sin. Okay, the sin itself stinks to high heaven. Sin destroys our, real, our fellowship with the Lord. The Bible speaks against all sin, but actually there are certain sins that the Bible actually categorizes. Now it's not saying that those sins are worse than others because sin requires judgment, but it, it points out certain sins. So for instance, in, um, in 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So it actually points out about sexual immorality and how that is. It's a different category. The Message Bible, I love the Message Bible translation of um, 1 Corinthians 6.18. It says there's a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with one another. Or didn't you realize that your body is a secret place, a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please, squandering what God paid such a high price for. The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. So basically, you are bought with a price. Your body and your spirit belong to God. Okay? So sexual sin, the Bible actually categorizes it as not just a sin against God, but it's a sin against your own body. Okay? Okay? But also, the Bible also talks about homosexuality in very specific terms. If you look at um, Romans 1.25, the New Living Translation, look at Romans 1.25, New Living Translation. It says, they, now we don't know who he's talking about yet, but we'll know it a bit later on. It says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served things God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalties they deserved. So when it comes to sexual immorality, the Bible focuses on it as not just a sin, but it's a sin against your body. But then when he talks about homosexuality and lesbianism, it says it is not just a sin, but it is unnatural. Yeah, it is a sin against the nature and the way God ordered things to be. In fact, the uh, New King James, instead of using the term shameful desires, he says God gave them up to vile passions and there are Diseases that come out of that kind of relationship that are unique in themselves. And it is, like the Bible says, a fruit of a judgment because of those shameful acts. Okay? So all sin is equal. It will get us, it will destroy fellowship with the Lord and and cause us to end up in hell. But certain sins are a sin against our body and certain sins are even unnatural. And that was the reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Christians should not treat any sin differently. However, sexual sins are also sins against your body, etc., etc. The more tolerant a culture is 
toward homosexuality, the more godless that culture is. I'll say that again. The more tolerant a culture is about homosexuality, it is not a, an indication of modernity, that they are modern. No, it is an indication of godlessness. The perpetuation of homosexuality and lesbianism will actually lead to the extinction of the human race. Yeah, if all we did was be homosexuals and lesbians, then this race will end. And that's not God's plan and God's will. Okay? Um, so, but thank God that in Christ there is forgiveness for all sin. And, you know, like the wise person once said, but for the grace of God, there go I. Okay? So everyone needs to be treated with grace but understand that um, there are those categorizations, but there's no justification for discriminating any, against anyone because you're a sinner too. Praise God. Okay. Okay. okay, so next question is on forgiving and forgiveness. It says, how does forgiving and forgetting work? It's funny how I've been able to work out forgiving and forgiveness but forgetting seems quite difficult for me. From a female perspective, how can I forgive rather, rather have a loving relationship with my father after abandonment? Okay, so I, I chose to take this question because it, it um, how would I put it now? It's something that I dealt with um, a while back. Now, this person has said, you know, they get, they get the forgiving bits. We, we know we have to forgive. But the first thing I would, I, would, um, I would remind you about is the scripture that says, honor your father and mother so that it will be well with you and you will live long. So kind of put that in one hand. Yeah, you have to honor them. The Bible does not say honor them if they do this or honor them if they do that. You have to honor them. Yeah. And sometimes when you've been abandoned, um, it makes it really, really difficult for you, um, perhaps even in marriage, you know, and that's when people say you have daddy issues, um, which <clears throat> as horrible as it actually sounds, I, I believe can be true to a degree. Now, the thing about forgiving, you said you got um, you, you do, you, you constantly forgive. And one easy way to, to keep forgiving is to keep on praying for your dad. Yeah? You keep on praying for him. Not only do you pray for him, you go the extra mile. And I'm talking to you about stuff I did that worked. Go the extra mile. Give him a call from time to time. Yeah? Um... It doesn't have to be anything huge. You can, if you feel you can't talk, send him a gift. Yeah? Send him a gift. Send him some money. Do your bit. Yeah? Sometimes you don't have to like a person to love them. Yeah? And it takes a little while to get to the place where you need to be. Yeah? Healing, um, when it comes to parents, sometimes takes a while. Yeah? The bit about forgetting, I'll tell you what helps you forget. What helps you forget is you remembering, it might be the one, two, three things that he ever did well, and begin to recall them, yeah? What helps you to forget is the fact that your first father is the Lord, and you make him real to you, yeah? Yeah? There is no father that is perfect, yeah? There's no book that comes to say, this is how to raise my child. Sometimes your dad grew up with issues, and therefore, because he didn't, you know, or, or was unable to resolve those issues, and just didn't know how to behave like a dad, um, you know, he's, he's projected it on you. And so you end up feeling abandoned. Yes? I, I can't stress praying for him as much as I'm doing. I, I really, you have to keep praying for him. Every time 
the thought of your dad comes up, you have to say, Lord, I love my dad. That's the family you chose for me to be born into. The Lord doesn't really make mistakes. You know, one way or the other, you had to come into this earth. And that's the, that's the channel that the Lord chose to bring you in. Yeah? Now, just because the Lord, you know, you, you found the Lord quickly. Maybe your dad just hasn't or didn't at the time. You know, it doesn't mean that you condemn him. Yeah? So, you, you just hold on. Hold on to the promise you know, hold on to, the, even if, in fact, forget your dad to a degree. Hold on to the fact that you want to live long and you want your life to be good. You know, you don't want to die prematurely. Yeah? Hold on to the fact that you, 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 you learn lessons within your family. You know, I, I say to my kids that the best teaching ground for anybody is the family. Yeah? You're going to have siblings that you don't agree with. You're going to have parents that seem to somehow never get you or, or rub you up the wrong way. Yeah? But that's where you learn because your family as well is a cross-section of society. You're going to have different personality types. Yeah? And um, with the different personality types, you have to realize, okay, like, okay, this person is wired this way and so the best way I can relate to that person is by doing this or by doing that. So, um, uh, where are we now? Yeah, so from a f female perspective, um, the way you can develop that loving relationship is, is to keep confessing positive and keep praying for the person. And if this isn't, um, if my answer hasn't really been clear or precise, you can come and see me after the service. Like I said, you know, it's something that I dealt with for many, many, many years to the point where I used to say, like, if you ask me about my dad, I'll tell you he was dead. Yeah? And I'm, I'm saying that now because I, to, to an extent, regret those, well, I shouldn't say to an extent, I totally regret ever say, saying that because your words have so much power and you can change the course of your father's life as a Christian, you can cause him to be loving if you keep on praying for him and you can change your life and find joy even at, you know, the last stages of his, of his years. You can give him joy as a gift for having you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, last week we also looked at... Um, that passage in Matthew where about the unforgiving debtor, you know, and uh, it's important to forgive by faith. And um, one of the best ways is by remembering how much you've been forgiven, you know. And, um, you know, forgiveness doesn't mean that your emotions get healed in, in, immediately. It just means that you choose not to act from that place of hurt, Yeah. So even if you are feeling a certain way, the fact that you're forgiven means that you're praying for the person, like your dad in this case. Your mind might be saying he doesn't deserve prayer, but by praying for them, you are choosing not to act from that place of hurt. Yeah? By sending a gift, you are choosing not to act from that place of hurt. You have forgiven irrespective of how you feel. And as you begin to obey the word, the Spirit of God will start healing your hurt, yeah? And it will start blessing your life, okay? Um, okay, so we're going to talk about, um, um, there's a question about singles. Do you want to take the first bit of that? And then I'll take the second bit. This question here. Oh, just skip the question can, altogether. No, we can do it together. <laughs> I'll answer the last okay. bit of it. Um, from a single's perspective, what are the priorities in a relationship for both the male and the female? Uh, I would say the priority one is to get to know one another in a platonic way. Yeah? Um, you really don't need to test out sex because I think that's the hidden question here. You, you, don't, you don't need to. You don't need to... Um, you know, try and see if we're compatible, you know, by having sex, no. 
Um, so your priority is really just, just to, you know, be friends, get to know what that person is really like. Go out, discover what that person likes outside, um, you know, um, you know, have, have fun together. And then it says, um, the world seems to have endorsed sex as a way of life. Thank goodness you're not part of the world. Amen. Yes. Um, one almost seems obliged to indulge in it. No. No. And then the person says, as a Christian by heart, how do I work and handle that pressure? Okay. I, I, I get what you mean, Christian by heart. I, I'd like to believe that it's more than just your heart in this walk that we're walking. Yes, your whole body has to be in here. Yes, and we're submitting our whole body as the temple of, of the Lord, right? Not just the heart, because it's like, okay, I'll sin, but my heart w wasn't there. No. You're, we're all in. Okay, so this is how you handle the pressure. You know the word, yeah? It says, flee all appearances of evil. Yeah, you're getting to know somebody. Um, you obviously like them to a degree already. If, if you, I'd like to say you, you know yourself to a degree. There are some things that you cannot handle. Don't go there. Yeah? If you're going out on a date, go somewhere public. Don't have a date in his house and somehow find your way to the sofa or the bedroom and say, you know, we're, we're just dating. Yes? Because it's going to lead to having sex. It will. Yeah? Look, um, how, how would I put it? But back in the day, you know, you go to, I mean, this is like university students who were in uni around the same time I was. Maybe guys were in quarters and the ladies were in the hostel and then, you know, he says, oh, you know, come come over to quarters for, for a meal. And of course, he's done up his room. There's lights, you know. I mean, there are just so many things. If you put yourself in that situation, you are going to have sex, okay? So don't. If you go to a public place and you still feel like, look, there's a chance that something can happen, go with a group of people, yeah? Have, have you know, a, a group, a group date, for want of a better phrase, and stay safe. Yeah? Um, the principle of godly dating, that's it. Don't have sex. I, I don't know how else to, to say it. Um, if you... Okay, for some, some, okay, so some people say, can we kiss? Say. You might kiss the person on the cheek. You might do that. And it may not do anything to you. You might be fine. For some people, you might smell the girl's perfume. And honestly, she's undressed. Yeah? So that's what I'm saying. It's very individual. You know where to draw the line. Yeah? You know where to draw the line. So don't put yourself in those kind of situations. And then the kind of friends... Make sure you have the kind of friends that really do have your back and are Christian as well. Not the kind that will say, oh, let's all go out. And then when they think, oh, it's getting all cozy and stuff, they leave you. Yeah? Those are not the kind of friends you want. Yeah? I'm saying this because I've had those kind of friends. And they don't help. They're not friends. Um, then it says, what do you do when you've identified your wife but do not feel ready in terms of maturity, finances, ETC, what sort of relationship do you pursue with this person? Same, same answer. Um, if you're not ready for marriage in terms of maturity, I don't know if we're talking about age here, age, age of one or both. Because um, if we're saying we're not mature, then you have no business even looking and thinking, you know, um, let's get married. Finances, go, look, figure out what you want to do with your life. Figure out who you are. Yeah, a lot of times we get into marriage and we really haven't found ourselves. We haven't found out what makes us tick, what, what excites us, what, you know, and then what happens is you get married and, and you feel at some point that you've lost your identity. But the truth of the matter is you never found your identity. So the best time to find it is before you get married. 
yeah? Find out what you're really like. A lot of times we don't know what we're like because we've spent so, you know, so much time in school or in our parents' house. We haven't really lived alone and I suppose our culture doesn't, um, our culture doesn't lend itself to that kind of getting to know ourselves properly. You know, in, in other cultures, when you're 16, you're already booted out of your, your parents' house and you begin to fend for yourself. But that doesn't really happen here. So when you finish uni, maybe you should spend a year living by yourself, see what it's like to pay bills, um, what it's like to be responsible for, for certain things, yeah, before you start saying, okay, let me get married. Yeah? And, and I have to say, go, don't just date one person. And I'm not saying be everywhere, but don't, don't be too quick. How, how should I put this? Don't be too quick to just jump on the one person that you feel has ever looked at you and made you blush, you know? Because you might go somewhere else, yeah? This is all in your immature state. Go somewhere else and suddenly find out that the world is so much more than your high school. You know, so in high school, you, you know, you've met somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm going to marry you. I'll just stay with you for the rest of my life. Never, I will never leave. And, the, and then you go to uni. Oh, man, is this what the girls look like? <laughs> so, you know, let's not be too hasty in this um, marriage business. Okay, so then the quest, next question is, um, what are some healthy barriers that two unmarried Christians should put up in their relationship? I've already talked about that. And to be honest, you know, when you ask these questions, most of the time you know the answer. Yeah? You know what the healthy barriers are. Yeah? Don't. If you feel, if, you, if, you ha if a question comes up in your mind, like, is this healthy? The answer is no, it's not. Don't do it. Yeah? Um, can a couple partake in marriage counseling before they're formally engaged? If you're sure that's the person, because how many times do you want to do marriage counseling? And how many times are you going to go to your pastor and say, you know what, um, it didn't work with Jack, so here's Simon. Yeah? So let's, let's be sure about what we're doing, because your pastor will ask you, like, ah, weren't you here last Tuesday with somebody else? Okay. So let's get that bit sorted. Um, so if you're sure that you're sure, then by all means. Um, but if you don't want to take the plunge, you know what, start reading books about marriage, because, you know, marriage... There's just so much. They don't tell you about the loving in-laws. They don't tell you about, you know, the rose-colored glasses coming off. They don't tell... There are so many things. They don't tell you that, you know, maybe, just maybe on day 50 of your marriage, your husband decides, well, this is, you know, this is what I do. I, I, I leave my socks lying about, you know. And then you find to your horror that that affects you. It bothers you so much. You know, so all those kind of things, you know, go and read books. Find out, like, oh, what do, what do married people, what are married people like? You know, ask people. You have married people around you. Ask them, like, oh, you know, I'm thinking of getting married. Is this going to be a deal breaker? You know, before I got married, I tell you, one, some, some of the, the deal breakers I had, which are so trivial now when I think about it, if you press my toothpaste from the middle of the tube, it bothers me. If you wee on my seat, it would bother... No, not actually, it wasn't wee because I felt the person would be mature. Um, but put, don't put the seat down. There's this thing about seats up and seats down for girls. You know, it's like, do you put it up? Do you put it down? I, I don't know. You know, but there, there are just all those things. So those are all things that you need to work through. I mean, they, they sound trivial, but sometimes you'll find that they can be a real source of irritation. You know, do you sleep on the left side of the bed? Do you want to have sex just every 53 days of the year <laughs> or less, you know? Um, okay, so it says, um, if you're dating someone you want to marry, to what extent should you begin to fulfill the role husband and wife you, you intend to be on what? Look, I can't even finish reading it. What are you asking here? It's like, okay, we, we intend to get married. So how much should I... You know, how far should I go to show that I'm going to be your wife one day? It sounds to me like you want to have sex. And I'm telling you that you can't. Yeah? This is, I'm older than a lot of you here. So I'm going to say it as a mom. Yeah? And as somebody who has been around the block. Um, and I'm not talking about... <laughs> that's, that came out so wrong. But I'm telling you this as a grown-up, honestly. You know what? 
you don't need to be having sex. You can have sex until you're tired, you know, when, when you get married, yeah? Don't try and test out sex. It, I, I say to people, you know, like, look, having sex, honestly, it's a great thing. It's, 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 sex is, is, how would I say, it's sweet, it's, it's nice. But there's something about sex when you're not supposed to be having it that can cause a lot of problems. You could have sex with somebody, and then he decides to walk. Don't blame him. Don't start saying, you know, the guy's just a dog. Yeah? Why did you undress? Yeah? Don't, don't even do it. And don't blame him. Yeah? Because he got what he want, wanted free of charge. So if you are going to be the cow that is being milked, um, don't, don't complain. He's drunk the milk. He's done. So what's left? There's, there's really nothing, you know? So you preserve yourself. You, you keep yourself, you know, so that he, there's something to look forward to. And there's something so beautiful about two people actually discovering sex together. That is, it's honestly, it's very different from one person being oh so experienced, yeah? Because a lot of times they feel like, yeah, they know it. And then maybe the other person doesn't know. And then that, the one that knows is just carrying on, you know, and you're not happy, and the person is happy. I mean, it, it, it just gets messy. So basically, don't have sex is my counsel in that, um, that, that um, um, babes, I think the next one is yeah. for you. Okay. Good morning, Pastor. Yes, yeah. that's you. Now, the, um, thanks. Um, in one of the earlier sessions on, the, on family matters, I did talk about uh, singles and, and what you really need to be focusing on um, during your time of singleness. And, and I spend a lot of time talking about that. So please get the earlier um, sessions and I think you'd, um, you'd benefit from that. Um, the, the other thing I'll mention about that is, is the fact that, um, um, well, it happens with both sexes, but particularly with women, um, if you have sex before marriage with somebody, it sort of messes up, from what I've told, I'm told, your objectivity in terms of assessing the suitability of the person. Yeah? Um, and, um, you know, it's like going in with blinders on, you know? Um, so you really want to, to keep yourself so that you can be more objective in analyzing the suitability of that person. Um, but there's a lot more on that that um, you will get in, that, uh, in, in, the, in the earlier message. But there's a question related to this that I, I need to answer. It's a very long question, but I'll just go straight to the heart of it. Um, this person was given an example uh, of my testimony uh, you know, in, uh, in proposing to Anita, and he sort of suggested that I indicated in one of the sessions, or I inferred in one of the sessions that um, God can lead you to maybe a violent person, yeah? Um, because I, I made this sweeping comment one time about if you are dating someone and the person gives you a slap, you know, that you should, um, you should, you know, make sure that the person has counseling, and then two years later, you know, see if indeed um, he has, you know, he has learned his lesson. Don't, don't make a decision to marry somebody. The point I was making was that if you genuinely are seeking God and you are trying to make a decision to marry someone, the Lord will allow you to see the true nature of the person. Uh, because I don't believe that the Lord makes decisions for us regarding who we are to marry. I believe that the Lord will help you, uh, the Lord will guide you, but ultimately it's your decision. And I use Genesis 24 as the framework for my position on that. Um, now, when Anita and I, I, I gave an, a, a testimony years ago, um, and this person seemed to have been in that session where I gave that testimony because he, he referred to it. 
um, because basically I was on a date somewhere with someone and he said that I said that while I was having that date, uh, the Lord told me that Anita was the one I was to get married to. But that wasn't the case. I, I, was, I said I was on a date and in my heart, you know, while I was having this date, I, I knew in my heart that, you know, what am I doing here? You know, Anita is the person I want to be with. So it wasn't like I felt that the Lord was uh, telling me that this is who you're going to marry. But I, I just, I came to that place of, that epiphany, if you like, that place of insight and understanding. But as we were pursuing, or as, as I responded to that, at some point, the Lord actually did speak to me and told me, he, he basically asked me the question. Uh, you know, the Lord, I've never, uh, in my whole life, I've probably heard the Lord speak to me twice. And when I say speak to me, I mean audibly. Um, he, of course, he leads us, he guides us, but primarily, the way he leads us is by the inward witness. But um, on this particular occasion, you know, as I was going to her place, uh, the Lord s- did speak to me, and he said, do you want her or don't you? And I said, I do. And he said, well, then you're going to have to love her, you know. And, and for me, that really helped me in terms of understanding how the, how the Lord does things, um, at least for me. And I feel that I have the witness of Scripture. The Lord will help you, uh, but he will not make the decision for you. But whoever you choose to marry, yes, you can make a bad decision or a good decision, <laughs> Yeah. But whoever you choose to marry, you still have to make that decision that you're going to love them. Uh, even if you feel you are led by the Lord, it doesn't inoculate your marriage from challenges. Okay, That sacrificial love, that loving one another, is still something you are going to have to do to have the kind of marriage that you truly desire. Yeah, Marriages don't drop from heaven. Okay, It requires two people um, submitting under the mighty hand of God. You know, I'll say one thing as we bring this to a close. Um, you, you know, it is very important that you get the heart of what this series is about. If you read Ephesians chapter 5, you'll understand the heart of the Lord. The Lord wants husband and wife to be satisfied because the marriage relationship is, is a, a demonstration of the relationship between Christ and his church. Yeah? It is a relationship where both are fulfilled. It is a relationship of honor. It is a relationship of sacrificial love. Okay? Uh, Even when there are challenges, there's a question that we can't deal with, but there's a question about what if this person's heart is hard towards me? How long should I stay? Okay? Very difficult questions to answer. But you know, 1 Peter 3 talks about the fact that even if your spouse is not obeying the word, it was talking about wives and husbands, that you can win him over. Okay, you can win him over. So sometimes we go to really tough challenges, but um, you know we don't we don't just jump out. We can win each other over. Some of us have been through really tough times. We enter marriage with baggage. In fact, I haven't come across a, any couple yet that didn't enter with baggage. All right, we enter marriage with baggage, and and it takes love to overcome the baggage. Okay, I mean maybe next week. Um, uh, I'm doing a a, a session on redeeming love. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about it. We all enter marriage with baggage. But if we jump out at the first sign of challenge, nobody will be married. Yeah? Um, So it's important that we we recognize the heart of God for marriage, and the Lord will help us. Uh, The Lord will help us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just want to see if I want to see anything else, and then we'll just uh, close this. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, praise God. Okay. You know, Jesus, speaking to a church in Revelation, in, in Revelation 3, said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Yeah, he was standing outside the church knocking. You know, Jesus is standing out, outside some of our marriages knocking, trying to come in. Yeah, as a child of God, understand that Jesus is not the Lord of your marriage unless you let him in. Yeah, it is possible to hear a message with itching ears and, and decide that you're going to hold on to the way you are doing marriage. But over this series, the Spirit of God has been speaking to you. Yeah, it is important that you let him in and submit your heart to the Lord. Uh, from some of the questions that came through, some of the women are going through a really horrible time. 
Some of the men are going through a really horrible time. It is important that we submit ourselves to one another in, in the fear of God. All right? Um, and if you are handling your marriage treacherously, uh, the Lord is going to speak on behalf of your wife. And he's going to speak on behalf of your husband. Do not wait for that day. All right? Because the Lord takes this thing seriously. Say, see this as another redeeming opportunity that the Lord has given all of us. And if we allow him to come in and submit to him, we will see the change that we truly desire. Amen. Well, let us stand to our feet. Praise the Lord. High life, we advance.